you think really happened to an entire family who went for a good vacation around Lake Michigan. Um, they were, you know, they, they were doing good and money-wise. They were a tight family. What happened to them and what could have happened is what I'm hoping that we can discuss in the comments down below. Now, this is the Robinson family murders, and I don't know if you heard about it. This was back in 1968, and um, let's just get started with the case because I think it's very, very interesting, and it kind of takes into different part and things that, I don't know, sometimes it's not common in the other cases that I cover. So, this was in 1968 around the Lake Michigan area. At the time, I don't know right now, I haven't visited, so I don't know if it's still the same way. But at the time, there were a lot of cottages that you could rent around that area. And people would rent them for longer periods of time, let's say for a month or sometimes even longer, to go and spend the summer there with their families. It was also a very well-known party area, so if you wanted to have a good time, you could go there and uh, find somebody else who was on vacation and have a good time. So everything started with a group of girls that they were actually um, going to party and have a good time. And one night they were having a little party outside. Apparently they met other people in the area and they had a little get together, kind of wild partying outside. However, while they were outside, they started smelling this foul, you know, odor. It was very, very strong, and they immediately associated that smell with some kind of a dead animal that might have died or was killed maybe by somebody and left around the area, but it was so, so, so strong. And maybe because of the wind going their way or whatever, but it was so strong that they just, they couldn't continue to have a good time just because of that. So they decided to contact the maintenance guy who was um, taking care of the cottages. So the guy comes and um, he immediately can smell it. So he starts walking around and apparently the scent or the smell came from about half a mile away. Again, they were expecting to remove some kind of a dead animal or something that was, you know, uh, being the cause of the odor, odor but uh, they just couldn't. So he started to check in the other cottages and see if there was something, you know, in there. But he immediately realized that the smell was coming from a specific one. And when he saw the cottage, it had the windows broken. So it immediately look a little bit suspicious. Maybe the scent or the smell was so bad because of that, um, you know, window that was broken, but that kind of sparked their attention. So he grabbed another person that I'm sure that worked with him, and they decided to go check it out. When they peeked through the window, they saw a body just from the get-go in the living room area, and this was the body of a man. The smell, just so you picture a nasty picture in your head right now, the, the smell was horrible. And not only that, but it was full of flies. Remember that it was summertime, so since it was summer, I mean, the hot weather, a dead body, that it seemed like it was there for a really, really long time. It really just kind of added to everything, and it just a horrible sight. Um, inside, uh, there was um, Richard Robinson, which is was the father and the man that they saw in the living room. Shirley Robinson, which was his wife. Uh, Richard Jr., who was 19. Gary, who was 17. Randy, 12. And little Susan, who was 8. Those were all the victims in you know, it was the couple and their kids staying there. Now, they, they've they been on the cottage for quite some time now. Uh, they, I think it's been a month since they rented it, and they all usually would uh, rent it for longer periods of time. Um, the family uh, was planned to leave to Florida, so it wasn't like, okay, they were going on vacation, and then they were 
going straight back home. Now, this family, I mean, they had a business, they had the means to continue to travel and not have to go back to their business or their work. So they, um, you know, they, they were going to spend some time there and then move to Florida. So nobody reported them missing. That's the whole point of that. Now, the bodies, I mean, uh, it's, it's a little gruesome, but uh, they were repositioned. So they were kind of set up in a way. And uh, some of the valuables that they had had been taken. Um, Shirley was positioned in a way that it seemed like she was sexually assaulted. But when, you know, the, the maintenance guy called the police, they did uh, check and she wasn't. Uh, they, whoever killed them, had a caliber twenty two rifle and started shooting from outside, according to the police, until he killed Richard. Then he probably got inside and finished the rest of the family with a Beretta pistol whatever that is. Um, then he grabbed a hammer and used it on Richard repeatedly, showing some kind of a personal hatred towards the guy. Immediately the police realized that whoever killed his family knew them. And also they knew that this was kind of a... somebody who was really mad at Richard and that is why he you know, it was damaged the most, his body. Then apparently, uh, he moved to the eight-year-old, you know, whoever killed him, and Susan, and he beat her so much that he crashed her bones, and then he vanished into the woods. That's the, the theory that the police had. They started the investigation trying to ask the help from the public, and also kind of going through Richard's business, which Richard was a successful advertising executive and publisher, and one of his employees uh, was looking a little bit fishy. His name was Joe. Um, he worked very closely with Richard, and he looked kind of suspicious from the beginning. Apparently, this guy was very much trusted by Richard, but not for you know, from everybody, everybody would kind of think that the guy was not a trustworthy kind of guy and uh, had a criminal background that Richard knew about. It wasn't like it was hiding. No, he told Richard about his criminal history and everything, but um, he still, he still trusted this guy, even though a lot of people didn't. Um, Joe denied it immediately and took three polygraphs uh, to prove his innocence. However, uh, the first two he failed and the third one was inconclusive. Now, that proves nothing because that is not admissible in court. So even if it showed that he didn't pass it, it really didn't help the investigation that much. Uh, apparently, <laughs> this is the kind of thing that it's so weird officer in this at the scene that was handling the hammer that was used to kind of um, I don't know that it was used on the body of Richard after he died remember I told you about that well this guy the police officer what he did was used it in a way well, well he picked it up so they could take a picture of it but he wasn't careful so he messed with the fingerprints of he smudged the fingerprints that were in the hammer. So, because of that, they had no fingerprints or anything. Now, the police believe that the family was killed on or after June 25th. And why is that? Well, apparently, Richard was making some business calls on that morning. And one of the theories is that somebody called him and told him that Joe was embezzling money from their company. I don't know if it was a, you know, a partner of Richard or whatever the case may be, but uh, apparently he found out that morning and uh, when this other person was telling Richard over the phone about this, Joe left the office and never came back. Um, now, they talked to um, the people that were in the area at the time and apparently the next day on June 26th, they were 
working on the trees. There were some tree trimmer trimming around this Pacific Dodge, and they said the workers said that they did notice that uh, there was broken glass, but they didn't think anything of it. Now the closest neighbor also said that he heard a few gunshots that night, but it was you know a summertime, so it, it gets dark late. So he assumed that it was some kind of hunting that was going on at the time, and not really something bad, like a shooting or something. So he didn't report it to the police. Now let's go back to Joe. Joe was one of uh, Richard's favorite employees, so maybe, you know, since he got that notice on that day, you know, it, it was not only bad for the business, but it was also devastating because he really liked this guy. He trusted him, and one of the curious things is that Joe used to make $300 a week, and um, Richard gave him a raise and started paying him $1,000 a week shortly before he left on this trip. Now, uh, the bullet casings that were found matched Joe's gun, um, the kind of gun that he owned. Um, in this gun, coincidentally, was bought just a few days or weeks before they left to go to Lake Michigan. So it, it's starting to look a little bit suspicious, but it gets worse. Um, he also said that he never had that gun. He gave it to Richard when he left Lake Michigan. So he didn't have it at the time, which nobody could really confirm that that was what happened. The rifle also matched um, one that Joey, um, this guy Joe owned, and um, however, he had two rifles, and he gave one away to one of his friends, and it was accounted for in Chicago, and the other one was, um, he said that he gave it to his brother, but they really couldn't never confirm that he did that. So, by now, Joe's guns, both of them, kind of that were used to kill this family. But some things didn't add up. Now, I'm going to go through that. Now, the drive from where Joe lived and worked to Lake Michigan, it was about six hours, okay? So he could have left and killed them that night. But he was back home by 11 p.m. So if, in fact, he did kill them around 9 p.m. at the time that the neighbor heard that a gunshot, it's kind of interesting to see that he came back to his house really um, very, very quickly. How did he do it? I'm not sure. So, he, in the police eyes, he couldn't have done it. And uh, the police believe that hiring somebody in such a short notice, since, you know, Richard found out about this in the morning, it wasn't really something that was likely, but it was a possibility. When they investigated Richard and his business, they also started to find kind of a, um, I don't know how to say it, but kind of interesting things like to people he looked very sweet and very innocent, but um, when they talked to business partners and people that work with him, they realized that he had more of a darker side or a different side for business, which is perfectly normal. I don't think that should be a red flag or anything like that. So, they also learned that Richard uh, wore a medallion, which is interesting. That That's pretty interesting. And it was featuring St. Christopher with an even stranger um, inscription on the back. And it said, uh, to Richard, my chosen son, an heir, God bless you, Robert. Now, they also found some letters in his office, and uh, they were to Mr. Roberts, which we have no idea who this Mr. Roberts is. And when they, um, when they talked to the people in the office, they, nobody knew who this Mr. Roberts is. Um, then the police found a chart, and this chart was really puzzling to the police because um, he, he kind of showed the police that he had a lot of secrets and he had bigger plans than what he was
was telling or portraying to the rest of the world. Um, now, I'm going to read what it said on the tablet, kind of a little bit on it, not the entire thing, but it said the superior uh, table. Uh, this is a secret organization that apparently he was part of, but it had a, a list of members and it had Mr. Thomas, Mr. Richard, Mr. Joseph, Mr. Peters, Mr. Martin, and Mr. Robert. Again, kind of interesting, but this was a file that apparently was written by Mr. Robert's secretary, and her name was Sylvia. Um, and also, let's, let's keep going through this thing. It said, the above shows the chain of power decided by Mr. Robert Chairman and Director of the Superior Table. The governor power of this worldwide organization, which is only set in complete peace and unity among all countries of the earth. Each of the above mentioned directors will receive a complete organizational breakdown from our computer headquarters. Um, no friends or family knew anything about this. Uh, nobody heard or seen anything. And uh, it was, again, it was kind of hard for the police to investigate when nobody had no idea. And anybody had any, they, don't, they didn't know these people. And apparently the list of people in here it was the list and how they were in power or in the power in this organization. Now, this is something that it, it was 100% proved, but apparently, well, it wasn't 100% known that Richard had anything to do with this, but uh, apparently his company was stealing money and he was not being as transparent in his business. Um, apparently, one of the clients that they were stealing from was Delta Faucets. And they were over overbilling the company for advertising space. A lot of money was also missing from that account too, before the family did. So, right before they die, somebody took a lot of money out of that account. However, nobody could confirm if Richard was the one behind all this or if an employee was doing this and benefiting directly from all this stealing. Another interesting fact is that the overbilling started right after Joe started working for Richard. So there is a possibility that it was only Joe was stealing that money and kind of not even telling Richard about it. When the accountant company was questioned because when they confronted Joe about, you know, what they were doing with this money, Joe told them that it was all Richard and his accountant's fault. When they talked to the accountant, the accountant said that he didn't want to talk about his work. And, the, the, and, and it's kind of interesting that, you know, the police couldn't make him talk, but that's what happened. Um, of course, right after Richard died, uh, learning all these things started to part and uh, kind of stay away from Richard's company and um, it started this speculation that Joe was the one that was you know stealing all this money before Richard died he also was working um, in a millions of dollars project apparently there was uh, some small air airfield um, in the new Hudson Airport that he wanted to invest money on and he wanted to make it invested to develop an international jet port there. Now, apparently the owners are the one that he was dealing with with a couple of guys and he went in person to talk to them and give them this offer and I'm talking about Richard, not Joe right now. And this happened before he died, you know, a, a few weeks before he died, and apparently uh, Richard went and kind of gave them the idea, the you know, the, the guys were not 
100% on it. So Richard decided to get a hotel nearby and kind of wait it off. However, um, they, this couple of guys were cold and kind of uh, intimidated into, st you know, getting into this business deal. I don't know with under what pretenses or what they did, but um, it was kind of telling them that they needed to get this. However, we don't have any information if they did, in fact, accept it. Richard's offer or not. Um, another thing is that uh, uh, the guys also thought that it might have been Richard kind of changing his voice to try to intimidate them. So it wasn't 100% confirmed that it was another person or maybe this Mr. Roberts. Because remember, Richard was doing really, really good in business. He didn't have the millions of dollars that he was offering this couple of guys to do what he wanted to do. So he was getting the money from somewhere else. And people believe that it was this Mr. Robert guy that maybe he had something to do with it. Now, in 1973, five years after the deaths, um, Joe neatly typed two letters. In one of the letters, he wrote, I am a liar, a cheat, a phony. But I'm not a killer. I am scared and I am sick. I did not kill the Robinsons. Then he made a list of people that he stole from. Or he, you know, doing, was doing those kind of business to get money from them. And he put like a list of companies and people that he stole from. Then he also left another letter. And in the other letter, just says, Mom, do not come in. So I guess that was his way of killing himself. Maybe trying to dump all the guilt into these letters and at the same time, I don't know, maybe clear his mind before he killed himself. But he didn't want his mom to find it. So find him. So there is a couple of theories. I mean, this is an unsolved mystery, but the idea is that somehow he managed to go and go and kill this family, and that is why he committed suicide. But I find it a little bit odd that he made these letters. You know, he seemed like he was trying to do the right thing at the end. And if he, in fact, killed these people, why not confess it? You're dying. You're not going to go to jail. You know what I mean? I don't believe that theory. And then there is um, other theories that say that Richard was traveling and going from place to place because he was, in fact, trying to hide from this Mr. Robert when he didn't get the deal or when he didn't get something that this Mr. Robert, which was a very powerful man, according to everything that we learn about him. Um, and so he was trying to hide from this guy. And since he knew, I mean, this Mr. Robert guy kind of knew who was he dealing with. And he probably knew about Joe because of Richard. And, and maybe he did buy, and, you know, similar guns that this guy had and tried to make Joe look very, very guilty because of his stealing, because of having the same kind of guns and that kind of thing. So that is a possibility. I think that that is more likely than the first theory. I think that when you get involved with people that are somehow part of a secret society or part of a secret something, there must be a reason why they are secret. Um, there's either some kind of illegal activity, there is maybe, you know, something that they're trying to create, but it's not 100% legal. Whatever the case may be, it kind of makes it harder for the police to investigate this kind of cases, and I believe that is how they get away with all this kind of craziness. not to do that. And I believe it's because he did 
focus on uh, Joe very easily if it wasn't because Joe made it, made it back home really early and it was impossible for him to be there uh, if in fact, you know, he was the one that killed him. That is my theory. It just really doesn't add up otherwise. This is not a random kill. This is not something that somebody was walking in the forest and decided to go kill somebody and they, they found this family. This was personal. This had a meaning. This had a purpose. And even though most, you know, uh, mafias or, you know, all those organization kind of things, not legal ones, uh, when they try to kill somebody or when they, in fact, kill somebody, they usually know, shoot them in the head and that's it. You know, that would kind of point to the, to the idea that it wasn't because, you know, it was kind of passionate. He was stabbed and the little girl was stabbed too. So maybe, you know, this Mr. Robert did have some kind of a relationship. Maybe he did love him like a son, like it said in the medallion. And maybe something happened. Maybe Richard was getting ready to open his mouth and he got desperate and you know that's what happened do we know who this mr robert is not really but again it kind of shows us that these things do exist and that they are so secret that i believe that maybe even people that it's very well known and maybe people in the pow in power are really part of this organizations and that's why you know they never come out there's a lot of things that come out and people talk about after they they leave but i don't think it's it's plausible or it's possible for you to leave or an organization like this and maybe this is the way that they take care of people that want to leave this organization so that is my theory i would love to know what your theory is in this case if you have anything different or if you watch a documentary or anything about this and you'd like to add please leave it in the comments down below now i'm gonna let you guys go by the time that you guys are watching this video it should be on friday i will be out of town so if you leave a comment and i don't reply right back to you it's just because i don't have internet on the road you know that i don't travel by plane or do anything fancy but uh, that means that sometimes i'm in the middle of nowhere and i don't have any signal for phone or internet so for that reason um i might not get to your messages right away however i will when i come back uh, it's just going to be a short trip um a new video should go up on monday a patreon video should go up on saturday and a um, special for october should go up on this wednesday you probably already saw that video but um anyways thank you so much for listening to this case let me know your thoughts down below and